start. Uh, my name is Elena Volpi, I direct the Swiss Center on Aging. And uh, I want to welcome you to the um, 20th annual uh, Lefebvre seri uh, Winter Series on Aging. Uh, uh, this is a lecture series um, of six lectures, which uh, starts on the last Tuesday of January, which is today. Um, and continues um, on through February until the first week of March. Um, the, uh, this lecture series honors the memory of Dr. Edward James Lefebvre, uh, who was a physician who began uh, providing medical care here in Galveston in 1939. Um, he was an internist, um, but over the years, um, he realized that a lot of his colleagues were not taking or decided not to take older patients because they were concerned, they were kind of scared of treating them. And so he decided to take on all these older patients uh, under his care. Um, he was also, um, and so he, he became essentially a geriatrician by trade. Um, and uh, he was also one of the innovators here on campus. He uh, was a teacher. Um, it was one of the first, I think the first, to do colonoscopies, endoscopies here before even GI was established. Um, and, uh, and so eventually he uh, became um, uh, really a, a, an outstanding geriatrician. He became the director of the Turners, uh, Turners and Moody's House, which is now the uh, Meridian. And uh, right before he died, um, the, uh, he was able to, uh, uh, to begin to see uh, his vision uh, come to fruition because the geriatric division started to get funded at that time. After his death, family and friends uh, came together to um, honor his memory with his endowment for this lecture series on aging. So today's, um, now I wanted to talk a little bit about today's speaker, um, who is uh, Dr. Judith Casper. Dr. Casper is a professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore. She is a senior associate in the Center on Aging and the Health Services Research and Development Center, which are both at Hopkins. Um, after graduating with a bachelor's degree um, in sociology and American studies from the University of Kansas, Dr. Casper received a master's and a PhD in sociology from University of Chicago. Um, and she worked for a while at the Department of Health and Human Services uh, for a few years uh, before becoming an assistant professor at Hopkins where she uh, climbed the entire academic ladder and uh, until um, reaching the current position as a professor. Uh, Dr. Casper is a nationally and international authority in health policy. In particular, uh, her interest is in disability and long-term care, um, assessment of needs for care and service provision to physically and mentally disabled people, healthcare financing and access for vulnerable uh, populations, and the development application of national surveys for health policy analysis and health services research. She is she's the principal investigator of the National Health and Aging Trends Study, which is funded by the NI, National Institute on Aging, uh, and supports the um, research of disability trends and dynamics among older people. She's also PI on many other uh, grants from the NIH and other um, funding sources. She's published more than 100 papers, four books, and many book chapters, and other publications, and has served on a number of important national and advisory panels for the government, including the Forum on Aging, Disability, and Independence of the Institute of Medicine and National Research Council of the National Academies, um, and also on a panel on developing quality measures for Medicaid home and community-based services of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. So uh, tonight, she will talk about the, uh, her National Health and um, Aging Trends Study, a resource for studying disability and independence in older people. So please join me to welcome Dr. Casper. Great, thank you. Um, thank you very much for that um, kind introduction and I'm delighted to be here today um, to talk to you about the National Health and Aging Trends Study. If I can hit the right button. So, <clears throat> why did the um, National Health and Aging Trend Study, or NHATS, as I will refer to it for the rest of this talk, 
um, come into being. Um, there was a, uh, a view that a new um, resource, scientific resource, to study uh, late life disability was, um, was needed and um, that understanding disability trends and dynamics in the older population was a critical component of being able to maximize functioning and, and enhance the quality of life of older Americans. Um, so um, this study was um, designed with that um, overall goal in mind and has been developed with um, broad input from the scientific community. Um, I'll talk a little more about that in a minute, but also dissemination <clears throat> of the data to the research com community so that many, uh, many of you who are working in this field will analyze this data and contribute to our knowledge, uh, not, not only the people who have been involved in its uh, design and implementation. So the original charge uh, from NIA when they ask for responses to, um, to, this, um, to this goal was to design a long-term study that would uh, promote um, ability to analyze trends, sort of so cross-sectional looks at what is happening to the population, but also trajectories to understand pathways um, that people follow, which are quite variable in later life in terms of their um, functional ability. And as well, to be able to help us understand uh, disparities in the older population with regard to disability, um, what the economic impact is on individuals and their families, um, and hopefully to lead people to be able to start thinking um, more about ways to intervene um, and improve um, functional status. Um, and also, of course, to include a lot of other important content in this study that informs, um, helps us inform, helps inform us um, as to um, trends and, and trajectories. So there are two overarching um, study aims, um, just to say one more time. Um, one is to promote within the field of aging research uh, scientific inquiry into late life disability, and the other is to advance um, social and economic, the study of social and economic consequences of late life disability for individuals, families, and society. So NHATS has been developed with a uh, multidisciplinary um, consortium of investigators. I am the PI, as, um, as Elena said, and uh, Vicki Friedman is the uh, co-PI. Vicki's on the faculty at the University of Michigan. And we have a number of um, co-investigators who bring different um, expertise, have brought different expertise to the development of NHATS, economists, uh, clinicians, um, people who are interested in uh, rehabilitation, uh, people who have uh, devoted themselves to long-term care and health services research. Um, and in addition to the, the list of names you see here, we also have an external scientific advisory panel which has, has brought um, other um, other needed expertise to the development of this study. So uh, we had as a goal um, in terms of development to uh, try to um, create um, a, a resource for study that would appeal across a wide variety of disciplines and interests in the field of aging. So what I'm going to talk about first <coughs> um, goes back to the developmental phase of the study, um, and um, this was our, our first um, baseline data collection happened in 2011, so there were a couple of years of pretty intense work before that started. And this um, conceptual framework you see um, has been a guiding, um, a guiding framework um, for developing and implementing this study. And what I want to um, point out here is that when we think of disability in the enhanced um, context, we think about it in, in broad terms, not only what's happening at the level of the individual, but also um, the environment they're living in, the accommodations they um, are able to 
uh, call on as function changes. And then um, we're interested in a number of different um, outcomes when we, when we think about functioning. Um, obviously important ones are people's ability to take care of themselves in the community, but also uh, what we call participation. So people's ability to engage in their community, engage in the activities that are meaningful to them in their, um, in their lives. So this um, is another conceptual framework. We like conceptual frameworks, um, which um, again, in green, you see highlighted the key components of our disability uh, protocol, which guided the kinds of information we collect from people in the two-hour interview that we do with them every year. But you also see some additional boxes in blue that, that were important in um, developing our, um, our study uh, content. So this um, hopefully embeds within a larger uh, framework the disability pieces. And those of you who have worked in this field for a while and know the, know the work of Verbrugge and Jetty will also recognize um, you know, that, that disablement, <clears throat> that disablement um, pathway um, that, that is part of this. So there are a number of um, <clears throat> key innovations that we like to call out for people um, in, the, in the development of NHATS. Um, we believe that our approach um, is providing uh, researchers with better measures to disentangle uh, capacity, um, what people are able to do, um, and an example of that are some of our measures of, of walking, for example, um, ability, what people actually are doing, and then accommodations, um, how the environment and various accommodations using devices help from other people changing the physical environment by adding um, you know, grab bars or ramps and so on, all play into um, how people tell us um, they are functioning in daily life. We have new <clears throat> areas in this study. I talked a little bit about participation already. Um, with regard to medical care, um, we have um, brought in some questions that ask about how other people may invo be involved in, in, in negotiating with the healthcare system, going to the doctor with people, um, interacting with the doctor, questions about healthcare engagement um, to better understand how older people are um, managing their medical care, often with the help of, um, of others. Um, and we have some additional content around consequences of disability. We ask questions about unmet need, for example. So when people tell us they um, have difficulty with meal preparation or they need help with meal preparation, we ask about whether there have been times in the past month when they were unable to have a hot meal because the help wasn't available or it was too difficult for them to do it. So that's kind of a consequence that we think is important um, in, in understanding gaps in um, support networks that people may have. <clears throat> we collect data annually in NHATS, which is um, Important, we feel, in terms of being able to really map um, pathways. Um, things can change rapidly in the lives of older people. Um, and long after spending a fair amount of time investigating alternative um, intervals between data collection, um, the evidence that we, put, that we pulled together suggested that annual data collection was important. And so that is the um, approach we've taken in terms of data collection. Um, I think I'm going to try to, well, <laughs> I, 
I'm watching the clock here. I wanted to give you a flavor of, of drilling down a little bit into some of our measures of accommodation and mobility. So maybe I'll do a couple of these. So um, we, oops, as, as I said, we um, assess accommodations, both environment and, and help from other people, and also use of assistive devices, which are particularly important in terms of mobility. Um, and you see some examples here of those items, but you also see um, a piece that we think is interesting, which has to do with technology and how people may be using computers um, to accomplish some activities in their, in, their, um, in their daily lives, like banking or shopping. Um, if you look at our measures of mobility and self-care, these are the uh, components of the questions that we ask in these areas. We ask about whether people are using devices or technologies to do the activities, whether there's, there's help from other people, whether they ever do the activity by themselves, and if they do, we ask about difficulty. And we also ask about whether frequency has changed since the last year. So one of the pieces um, in terms of changing functioning that other studies have suggested is important is before people are telling you they're having problems, they may be changing how often they do uh, certain activities. So what you see here um, is a listing of all of the sections in the in the NHATS um, interview. It, the print is too small for you to read it. I wanted mainly to make the point that all of the sections in white that you see here uh, relate to our disability protocol or components of that. And so you can see how um, how large part of the content of this particular study um, ties into those issues of disability uh, trends and trajectories. So there are a number of other um, enhancements to our core data collection that I also wanted to mention, and I'm just going to talk about a couple on this slide. One is the National Study of Caregiving, which we did in um, the very first year of the study, and we're going to be repeating this year, which is the fifth year of the study, which interviews people who are named as helpers to older individuals. And that, um, that particular interview really focuses on the helpers themselves, um, how they feel about the caregiving experience, both positive and negative, because positive um, experiences and feelings do come out of um, helping and caregiving. Um, we have um, questions in that section about support services uh, people may have sought. So the, the focus of that interview is on, um, is on the caregiving experience. Another um, data collection instrument that we introduced in round two is what we call the last month of life interview. So when one of our participants dies, we interview a proxy respondent um, and ask um, about uh, some of those experiences in the last month of life that the person may have had. We draw on work from uh, Joan Tino, who's very well known in this area, um, in designing that particular um, instrument. And um, questions um, both deal with where people may have died, where they may have been in the last month of life, but also whether, um, whether the person felt that the individual's uh, desires with regard to, um, well, whether they were treated with respect by the medical profession, whether their pain was dealt with, whether um, you know, those experiences, um, how those experiences at the end uh, went. Um, this is a little more detail about, um, about the National Study of Caregiving. Um, and again, I, I think I won't spend time on the detail here. We interviewed um, multiple caregivers for an individual if they, in fact, named multiple caregivers. Most people do only have one or two, but there are people with larger networks, and we tried to um, capture um, that broader um, network. 
again, I, I anticipated myself a bit. So the last month of life interview, um, which I already mentioned, um, is conducted with a proxy between rounds. And, I, and in addition to um, what I've already talked about, um, these are other sort of um, questions that are asked in that particular data collection. OK, so let me <clears throat> talk a little bit about the um, sample design. So the sampling frame for NHATS is the Medicare um, enrollment file. Um, so we select people who, are six, who were 65 or older um, back at the point at which we were doing the baseline data collection. That provides us with a nationally representative sample of um, people 65 and older in the U.S. The estimates are about 96% of people in that age group in the U.S. are enrolled um, in Medicare. The design is one that is age stratified across age groups. That means we, we um, oversample people at the older ages, but we do that so that we can make some comparisons across different age groups with regard to um, disability and other, um, other uh, variables of interest. There's an oversample of black individuals as well. <clears throat> but um, I, to this group, and I've said this to many of you today already, um, one of our um, limitations and disappointments was that we were unable to um, do an oversample of Hispanic uh, persons due to the limitations of the uh, race indicator on the Medicare enrollment file. There's a lot of misclassification around um, people who say they're Hispanic um, or white um, in, in the Medicare file, and many of you are familiar with that particular um, problem. So we do have certainly Hispanics represented in the data set um, at, the, at the level they exist in the older population, which I think is around 6%. Um, but we weren't able to kind of boost those numbers as we had originally um, hoped. <coughs> We are replenishing the sample in round five. That's this year. Um, so um, I think, yeah. So in round one, uh, what that means essentially is in round one, we had 8,200 uh, participants in the study for, for a 71 percent. Um, response rate. We have continued to follow those people, interview them every year, and you can see the numbers, you know, decline over time, as you would expect. And so, in round five, we will be bringing in new sample to boost the uh, the study population back to that um, 8,200 um, level. That has advantages in terms of people who are interested in looking at sort of longer term, um, five year trends of the whole um, population 65 plus. Um, so let me talk for a minute um, too about our, our core uh, data collection in instruments. So the sample person interview, as I said, is about um, two hours in length. <clears throat> and in addition to um, you know, questions, sort of an interview. Um, we also do do performance tests with, with people. We do a grip strength test, a walking test, a chair stand test. Um, and that's about 25, 25 minutes um, of, our, um, of our overall data collection time. Um, and we do use a proxy respondent if the sample person is unable to participate on their own. And about 7% of our um, interviews were with a proxy, which is in line with um, what is generally seen in studies um, of, this, of this type with this particular uh, population. Um, we have an activity booklet. Um, which I'm not showing pictures of. It's kind of interesting. Um, but it's the document that the interviewers use to record the information from the uh, performance test. And then we have something called a facility questionnaire. 
So this is an interview that we do. It's a short interview that when, when we determine that someone is living in a residential care kind of setting, and we use that term broadly, so that includes not only nursing homes, but um, assisted living. It also includes um, CCRC types of environments where there may be independent living components, as well as, um, as um, heavier you know, levels of care components. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a broad uh, category that indicates someone is in a living environment that has supports, either around meals, or around uh, personal care, or around medication help. And so when we determine that through the interview with a sample person, we go to, um, the interviewers are instructed to find somebody at the facility who then, is in, who then is interviewed. It's a brief interview, but it helps us understand the larger place and what the services are that are available in that place, um, what the, um, Service even if the if our individual participant is not um, not using particular uh, services, and we do ask about sources of payment and so on. So those are the the, the key um, instruments that are used in data collection. And uh, as I will say at the end, but I'll say it now as well, um, all of the instruments used in the study are on our website www.inhats.org, um, so that. Um, any, anybody who's uh, planning research can, can look at those. So <clears throat> an important um, philosophy in this study has been to try to collect comparable data across residential um, settings, um, because if you're um, you know, trying to understand the difference between people in community settings who are getting help from helpers versus someone who may be in a residential care setting and getting um, assistance from uh, professional staff and how different those people really are or are not. Um, it's important that the, that the data that's collected and the way you collect it is comparable across settings. So this perhaps a little too complicated slide um, <clears throat> is trying to lay out um, our major groups, people in the community, people who are in some kind of residential care that's not a nursing home, and then people who are in nursing homes. And as people are interviewed um, initially, um, we continue to follow and interview them um, regardless of whether they move into um, a different kind of setting. The only exception is that in round one, the relatively small number of people who were actually living in a nursing home at the very beginning of the study, we did not attempt to interview those people. We only did the facility interview, but we continue um, to collect that information about those individuals. But going forward, um, we always um, continue to, to um, interview people regardless of residential changes. <clears throat> so now let me turn to talking a little bit about where we are now um, and going forward for the next uh, five years with NHATS. Um, so we will continue the data collection that I have described and um, we are you know, releasing, and I will talk about that briefly at the end, you know, releasing the data to the research community um, as we go along and as quickly as we can uh, do it in a, in a high quality kind of way. Um, but we are adding some new things um, going forward, uh, one of which is collecting biomarker data. So we are going to be collecting dried blood spots. Um, we've added some investigators to the team, uh, Teresa Seaman at UCLA and Jeremy Walston at Hopkins, who will help us with those uh, protocols. And the idea there um, is to assay some of that um, material with the objective of um, looking for markers of inflammation primarily. We also do plan to set some of that aside um, for later, um, later investigation, depending on um, how things change and what seem to be um, scientific priorities. We're adding some new content. <clears throat> 
Um, one, one area that I'm going to talk about in a little more detail is use of uh, rehabilitation and therapies and how that might link to some of the disablement patterns, patterns that we see. And we've also enhanced content around um, services in retirement and senior communities. Um, those are the key things I wanted to mention there. Um, as I said, we're replenishing the sample in round five. Um, and we will be following, continuing to follow those people that we've been talking to now for the last five years going forward. Um, and <coughs> that, I think we'll probably represent about half of the people we interview in, in, um, in, this, in round five, and then we will be bringing a new sample, as I mentioned. So um, in terms of new uh, content, um, I guess I, I've already talked about most of what's um, of greatest interest here. I won't mention that we are going to be re-administering re, um, the National um, Study of Caregiving this year. Um, so that will be done um, for helpers to the to this um, 8,000 and some um, set of participants who are um, are interviewed this um, this year, and will be very similar in content to the interview uh, that we did in the baseline. We're also looking at the possibility of a longitudinal follow up with um, caregivers. That's still under discussion, but it's something we hope to do because there are not very many. Um, longitudinal studies of uh, caregivers, although one, one is going to happen here, I believe. So um, with the Hispanic um, epis. Um, so I thought I would talk a little bit more about the rehabilitation piece of this, given um, the interest in that area of many of the, the people here. Um, so we know that a large number of older adults um, receive uh, rehabilitation. Um, it includes you know, a variety of different kinds of therapies, as you all know. Um, and in some of the, the um, research we were looking into to try to determine uh, prevalence, it uh, suggested that at least 15% of the um, older population uses uh, these services in any given year. And that's data from 2009. It probably is higher at this point. And there's a fair amount of uh, money involved in this type of um, care as well. Um, and older adults uh, receive rehabilitation for many different conditions in many different settings, um, and often without prior hospitalization, even though you know, that is also an important um, way that these services often uh, come into being. <clears throat> and what we know about this is primarily uh, from Medicare claims and, and from studies that are in um, single uh, conditions or settings. And that is um, you know, cri critically important information. But we felt that um, we had the opportunity to talk to um, older individuals themselves about their experience with uh, rehabilitation and, um, and find out uh, more about both why people um, use these services and uh, what, they, um, what they think about them. And be able to link that in with all of the other um, rich data we have about changes in, in functioning. Um, so among the challenges in trying to design, design this particular um, content was, defining, <coughs> was how you define what rehabilitation is, given you know, how broad the many different kinds of services that that covers. And we, again, wanted questions that would apply across, you know, a wide variety of settings, whether people were getting therapy through home health or in, in, um, in a SNF or, um, you know, the various kinds of um, settings where this can occur. Um, and we decided to ask about um, rehab services in the last year. Oops. So this um, is an effort to kind of condense the content that's in this section. And I did leave a copy of this with um, Ken. And I am going to 
encourage him to share it with everyone who's, <laughs> who's interested. Um, so we first of all asked people, and I won't go into the definitional issues, but you know whether they received any of these kinds of services in the last year, we get some information about the time frame, whether it happened after surgery, where, where they were trying to improve their function, and that's a listing of sort of various bot places in the body, what kind of problem they were trying to improve, um, whether there were particular activities that, that, were, that were being targeted, um, whether there were some specific, the, these both, they're, they're different, but they both kind of play into, this is more of a functional getting out of bed walking. This is, this is kind of a broader, more task-oriented kind of um, approach, asking about whether um, you know, they were trying to improve caring for themselves, household tasks. We asked whether devices or equipment was recommended. Um, we have a list there um, where the services occurred. Um, and then we have some questions at the end about how, how they felt about whether their functioning um, improved um, as a result of this therapy, whether it met their goal, whether they had met their goals, whether they had any insurance limits that caused them to stop uh, therapy, and, and something about how things are going um, since they quit. So this really is, um, you know, new territory. I, we, we found no... Uh, prior um, efforts to try to dig into the rehabilitation therapy experience from the point of view of older individuals, and so we're we're hopeful that <clears throat> that this will be um, exciting for those of you who work in this particular area um, and something that can then link to all of the other information um, in the study. Um, so let me turn now. Um, to um, issues of um, access to the data um, and our dissemination efforts. Um, we have public use files. We have a website. We have a study website um, which has a lot of information, background about the study, but also is our main portal for um, reaching out to scientific um, investigators. We have public data files that are available. Um, you can register for those, and they really have, you know, almost all of the information that we collect from individuals um, with certain uh, kinds of sensitive, uh, potentially sort of higher level identifying information removed. We have a second level of uh, data we call sensitive demographic files, which uh, you can apply for as well. Um, those have a little more detailed information, age and years. Um, the National Study of Caregiving is a sensitive file. These, access to these files is mainly um, an effort for us to uh, review and determine that the person requesting them is a, um, is a, res is a researcher um, and has those kind of interests. And then we have restricted files. And there are two main uh, types of files here. One um, are the Medicare claims data that we have linked in for our uh, study participants. <clears throat> and the second um, set are geocoded address information. Um, we already have um, a number of applicants who are really interested in looking at some uh, measures of aging-friendly uh, communities. Um, there, are ex there are data sets that have some of that kind of information which um, you could link into information about where an individual lives and, and sort of perhaps be able to start getting at um, aspects of the environment that are even, that go even beyond, um, you know, the physical place that somebody lives, transportation options and things of that um, nature. Um, we have documents on our website. Uh, about procedures for accessing all of these kinds of um, data sets and a lot of other documentation for um, users. Um, again, um, 
this, this goes into a little more detail about what I just um, explained with regard to the various kinds of data sets um, that we have available. And I recognize not everybody in the audience is necessarily going to be downloading uh, data and producing, uh, producing tables. But um, for those of you who um, are, um, I hope this will be, um, will be helpful. So let me talk a little bit about the Medicare uh, linkages because I, I know that um, is something that's, um, that's of interest. So we have linked uh, summary information about beneficiaries um, to our, our study population. And it actually goes back retrospectively for several years before the first year of interview, which was 2011. So you have a history in terms of chronic conditions, for example and inpatient hospitalizations. Um, and then you can see here the list of um, other files. And these, I can, <laughs> this is all CMS uh, speak acronyms, uh, skilled nursing facilities, which are um, you know, nursing homes that provide uh, rehabilitation. Um, this actually is physician um, office visit um, data. This is outpatient um, hospital data hospice data, home health, durable medical equipment. So that has to do with wheelchairs and equipment that Medicare will pay for for beneficiaries. So all of that kind of information um, has been linked in. These are the two files that tell you about home health and uh, more information about um, nursing home experiences. This is a, a rehab, um, inpatient rehab file. And then we are going to be linking the Part D uh, prescription medication data in as well, uh, but that has not happened yet. Um, we also do plan to do a national data index link. I was talking um, earlier with, with some of the people here about that. And we're going to be doing more linkages to um, the Dartmouth Health Atlas, which is a a uh, website that Dartmouth maintains that has a lot of information about geographic variation in um, health services. And then another um, site that's maintained at Brown University that has indicators of, um, of supply and quality of long-term care um, facilities um, that's, that's sort of similar to Dartmouth but more focused on, um, on long-term care. So um, I hope that, uh, you know, at present we have about 1,000 um, registered users at our, um, at our website who come from a very uh, broad um, set of um, scientific interests. And uh, one, of, one of the things that I hope to have um, accomplished is to encourage more, more of those, more of you here to, to join our user community, those who, um, who have not. And um, that is the end of my prepared remarks. I have not um, included in this presentation, um, you know, much in the way of findings that have come out in various um, papers. We had a special issue in the Journal of Gerontology. So I hope those of you who are interested in, in, uh, in what has come out of Enhance so far will consult some of those um, sources. Again, we have a, we have a complete bibliography um, on the website um, for those of you who um, want to know more about the not, not as want to know more beyond the, uh, you know, the operational um, aspects of the study. So thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about NHATS, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Anybody ask questions for Dr. Casper? Jen? So um, Medicare Part D denominator, so it's like, it's on everyone. My understanding is that everyone, whether they get Part D or not, has a Hispanic surname algorithm. And when we use it, mm -hmm. it doubles. It's the same thing, or very similar to what's used in SEER and mm -hmm. things like that. 
it, it doubles mm -hmm. the prevalence of Hispanics, and it's, and it's very close to, I mean, it's obviously different than census data, but, mm -hmm. but, but it's, it's much mm -hmm. closer to estimates of what the prevalence mm -hmm. would be. And so I just, you know, and you don't need the Medicare, you don't need to buy the, or link the Medicare, the whole, the part, the whole part B, just their denominator file. Well, I'm not so. I'm not sure. I, so we in in the sampling phase of the study, we did we did do some investigation of that enhanced indicator. And you're right; it definitely improves your ability to um, accurately classify people as Hispanic. But the and again, here I'm sort of the sampling statisticians. I mean, the work that we did suggested that a sam that as a sampling indicator, where you really don't want misclassification because you end up giving people weights that are not accurate given you know give, given you know what they are so that so from the sampling point of view that's why in the end you know we didn't we didn't use that now the you know the medicare um, variable that that in, that is in you know it's in the linked files but i mean we also have self reported we have self reported race and ethnicity you know in our in our study um, and so we have accurate representation of who is hispanic according to individuals themselves we just weren't able to find a way to overrepresent those those people there, there are two Dr. Quo can correct me if I'm wrong. There are two sources where you look for ethnicity in Medicare data. And one gives you an estimate that's twice as high as the other. And, and so, and then I don't see a sample because other than... Well, I, I think all the, I, there's really only one. I mean, whatever is in Part D is, is whatever is in, it all comes from one source, which is Social Security originally. And so I think that in the enhanced indicator you're talking about, um, you know, is on would be on all the claims. It wouldn't just be on Part D. It's there throughout throughout all the all the claims. And it, it's a different variable. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're gonna, we can talk more, you know, about it later. But sort of into, we're into the weeds, I guess, for for many people. But. Is there any other question? Yes. Yeah. Describe some of the characteristics of uh, those caregivers who view caregiving as a positive experience. But most time, all I is about caregiver stress, caregiver body. Right. But from what you said, there is a, you know, a significant portion of caregivers who, are, who, who find it positive. What define it? What well, okay, so. Um, the caregiving literature, much of it has focused on caring for people with dementia and has, as you said, found mainly, has focused mainly on burden. And, and in part, some of the studies have not really included much in the way of questions that that ask about the more positive part of the experience. There is some literature, I mean, I'm aware of something around stroke that was published not very long ago that, that suggested positive health effects around caregiving. But I think, you know, our view was that we wanted to ask a balance of both uh, positive and negative um, aspects of the caregiving experience. So we have questions about whether it's financially difficult, emotionally difficult, and so on, but we also have questions about um, whether people, uh, you know, felt they learned from something from the experience, whether, you know, how it affected their relationship with the person, which could be, could be positive or negative. Um, and so, you know, I think the, so we've done some preliminary analysis of that, which, as you said, does suggest that um, many people report positive aspects of that um, caregiving experience. And I think, 
you know, I don't, we didn't look at this, but, you know, my guess is that probably there are people, it's not as though there's a person here who only has good things to say and a person here who only has bad things to say. My guess is that many people have both good and bad things to say. Um, I mean, you know, we've only uh, kind of taken a first pass in terms of analyzing um, that information, but, you know, I think that it gives the analysts the option of sort of exploring um, both sides of that picture and how it may differ depending on the person you're taking care of, the, what kinds of problems they have, what your relationship to them is. Although you didn't talk about this in your, in your talk tonight, have you seen any trends in disability that have been uh, that are evident? So um, we're still in the early stages of looking at that. I mean, the person, I'm not directly involved in that particular research. The person who's doing it, um, who um, is, is suggesting that there may be some gender differences um, in terms of um, what's happening with trends. I mean, there, the research in that area um, for many years indicated disability was declining in the older population. Um, more recent research has suggested that that may be sort of leveling out. There have been concerns about um, people who are moving into the older population now may, be, um, may not be as healthy. People who study obesity and those kinds of issues have expressed those concerns. So I think it's, there's a lot, uh, there's uncertainty about whether, you know, a downward trend is going, continue, going to continue or whether it's flattening out or whether it may be going in different directions for different segments of the population. And, and we're, real, we're really still so early, even though we've been doing this for a few years now, in terms of the data we have in hand, we have three rounds of data at this point, so we're still um, early in that. But clearly, those are the kinds of issues that, um, that we hope these data will help us understand. Dr. Brown. I have a two-part question. Do you have people who are participants from across the country? And if so, so yes, yeah, so it's this is a nationally representative sample, but it is ge it it is geographically clustered, and and it uses you know an approach that is commonly used in many other in terms of that sample design, many other large national surveys that is done by the National Center for Health Statistics and others. So we work with. Um, Westat, which is a survey um, firm that has a national, a large national um, network, study network. And, um, and while I'm talking about Westat, I hope I said at the beginning that the National Institute of Aging was, was funding in hats, and if I didn't, I'm saying it now, you said it. <laughs> yes. Dr. Deer. Um, you talked a little bit about looking at some biomarkers no, um, I don't. I don't, at present, I'm not aware of any large national survey that tries to collect whole blood because of the um, the cost involved. Because when you're doing that, you have to have phlebotomists. You have to. Um, it's you know. So what we're doing, uh, dry blood spots. It's something you can you can train lay interviewers um, to collect. And Teresa Seaman has a lot of experience um, in doing that. And that's the only biomarker uh, data collection we're doing at this point. We talked about um, saliva, we talked about hair, we talked about, um, <laughs> I think what else we talked, there are a number of you know, things you can think about collecting, but we felt that given our focus on disability and where the, that the research seems to suggest that inflammation may be may be um, important and that that's something we could, we could assay from the, from the blood spots. Um, and some of the other uh, specimens, um, you know, that wouldn't be an option, so. 
to the follow up question yeah. of that, what do, what do you intend to get out of the dry field spot? So we have three, uh, uh, three assays that we plan to do um, at the outset, and I'm not, IL-6 is one. I'm probably not going to be able, I'm not going to be able off the top of my head to tell you what the other two are. But, um, but we also plan to set, so we're, we're thinking right now that we will do um, several cards, and I think the number is still under discussion, with the idea that we can assay, say we do four, we can assay two, we could store two, and then, um, you know, bring in some scientific experts and people to advise on what they think would be the best use um, for, the, for those uh, resources down the road. So if there's no more questions, we continue to actually talk to Dr. Casper here in the, uh, in the foyer, which is where we have some wine and cheese and some um, uh, refreshments. So thank you very much. UTMB Health, working together to work wonders.